distinguished visiting professor here at the University of Chicago this quarter. Um, in Chicago, she is the special guest of the Nicholson Center for British Studies and an affiliate of the Department of English Literature and Language. And her visit has been warmly welcomed by many other groups here, including the Department of South Asian Languages and um, Cultures and Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, as well as uh, 3CT. Um, Raji's most recent position was as Global Distinguished Professor at New York University, a, professor, a position she has only just left, but before that, um, until 2006, she was reader in post-colonial literature at Oxford University. The Oxford eccentricity of the title belies the distinction of this position. She had held fellowships, she has held fellowships and other positions in universities in North America and India and has presented her work in universities around the world. She is the major figure in post-colonial feminist and cultural um, and literary studies whose work is internationally admired and which continues to shape these ever evolving and vital fields of scholarly inquiry and has done for over uh, three decades. As this is the second of these two lectures, the first of which was eloquently introduced by Roshana Majundar last Tuesday, I'm not going to give a long introduction. Actually, that's a lie. It is quite a long introduction, but anyway, here goes. <laughs> I would like to use the opportunity to speak a little about Raji's work from my perspective as a scholar of 19th century British literature, a field somewhat adrift from the main current of Raji's work. I do this mainly as a way of indicating the broad reach of, um, of, of her work, but also to acknowledge publicly a personal debt to her for many years of collaborative friendship that crosses between our institutional, intellectual and private lives. For, as Roshana noted last week when introducing Raji, it's impossible not to mention the high affection in which she is held by all scholars who have worked with her, and especially, I think, uh, those who have had the opportunity to be her student. So one of my overriding impressions of Raji or memories of Raji when we were colleagues together in Oxford was a vision of her, um, a small, small her, surrounded by a troop of admiring and affectionate at graduate students and young researchers, always alongside her, knitted together by mutual bonds of support and shared interest. It was always a she was never, never a singular Raji, she always had a crowd with her. And I used to wonder if there were tensions between those students, because since I know students, so that it's possible that there were, um, but the overriding impression from outside was of this very benign scholarly friendship that existed between all of them, inspired by their leader, Raji. It was, I think, and is the I best kind of tutorship the there can possibly be. So I first encountered Raji in print before I met her in person through her first book, Real and Imagined Women, that was published in 1993. And if I were to list the influential books that shaped my thinking in that decade, I'd place this one very high up on the list, not just for its treatment of feminist topics that were of pressing concern at this juncture, but principally for the method that she developed in it. What I found so impressive was the very deft way that she drew literary and cultural sources into highly political social um, contexts in ways that shed new light in both directions. There were others doing work like this at this period and in this field alongside Raji's work I remember reading Lata Mani's work and um, Gayatri Spivak of course and this was the time in which in more familiar areas to me of um, familiar areas of literary criticism was the time of new historicism where others were attempting similar kinds of contextualized um, kind of political readings of, um, of texts but I found the robustness and the pliability of Raji's approach, the deepest, the most committed, and actually the most generative of, of them all, which helped me to think through issues that I was interested in, in extremely different contexts. Her work makes the literary truly political, and the political, in a way, literary. 
At the time I read her work, I knew nothing about her as a person, so that when I heard in 2001 she was appointed to a position in, um, of all places, Oxford University, I was a bit taken aback. And her being there made the position that I was offered there a few years later seem immensely more alluring than it would have done otherwise. It certainly enriched the intellectual and social context there for me. We were institutional colleagues for a few years, but our most extensive intellectual collaboration came later when we together imagined and indeed realized our commodities network, the commodities and culture in the colonial world, a series of conferences and workshops and eventually a, a volume, um, the workshops that we held in India, North America, Britain, um, with with offshoots in South Africa and participants also in Aus Australia too. This for me was totally transformative and it was only made possible by Raji's rigorous and generative approach to cultural imaginaries and their political contexts and effects. And I think that that network lives on in various ways um, in different forms um, uh, even now. So I said more than enough for an introduction. These lectures are connected to a book project that Raji she laid out for us last week, and it sees her taking a more directly literary turn than in other recent books. In this project, the first object of her sight is the form of, a literary, uh, of the literary genre, the Anglophone novel in India after Midnight's Children. Last, work, last week, we heard her talk about whiteness envy, and today she's going to talk to the title Inheriting the Nation, Fathers, Sons and Daughters, and the anxiety of influence. So after the lecture, there will be time for questions, um, including people on Zoom. So um, I think if you're um, virtually here, that if you'd like to ask a question to um, indicate this in the chat, and we will either um, call on you. We can project your face on the screen, although nobody seems to like that. But anyway, um, it's a possibility. Um, but or otherwise, you can just talk or I can read. OK. Thank you. Raji, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Joe, and thank you all for being here. Um, and Joe, in the capacity of director of the Nicholson Center as a colleague in the English department, and as, of course, and above all, uh, a long standing friend and collaborator, I'm very, very grateful uh, for this opportunity um, to present my work. Uh, basically, um, to get me out of uh, a, a sort of paralysis about this book, which has been in the works for a very long time and for various reasons, and for no reason at all, in fact, hasn't seen the light of day yet. So, uh, so this, uh, as I said, is the second of two chapters, uh, second of, of course, six chapters of the book. And um, it follows on the previous one in Whiteness Envy, uh, and, and, and I'm exploring in this uh, in this in this larger work uh, the ways Sorry, in which I'm still not sure about that. Uh, following on Rusty in Midnight Children, the decade of the 1980s and the 90s mostly, uh, uh, are in a sense writing the nation as they are known to be overtly explicitly. That's the project, uh, but the specific ways in which the nation in a sense is written um, and, 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 and the modes of, uh, uh, of relationship and claims and responsibilities that are articulated uh, by these writers, which vary widely. Uh, in this case, it's a question uh, literally of inheriting the nation from those who uh, engaged in the freedom struggle. And these were children of midnight, which means uh, they were born at, or, uh, during, at, or shortly after uh, the Declaration of Independence in 1947. So around the time in the late 70s and the 80s, they were actually coming of age and were in a position to 
uh, inherit the nation, the positions of responsibility and authority, and, uh, and how they viewed this, and uh, the kind of psychic narrative of this ownership, of this uh, inheritance. Uh, so this, of course, is, uh, I'm not going to read out the quotations as I put them up, but this is, in a sense, Derrida's idea of inheritance, which uh, he writes about in the context of Marx and Marxists. So, and, and, and my equivalence of that will be really Gandhi and Gandhians. In the narratives of Anglophone Indians of the generation of midnight, one can discern the lineaments of a psychobiography that places their protagonists in a defining relationship with their ancestors. The ancestor figures are notably fathers, but occasionally and variously also mothers or grandfathers and grandmothers. The fact that the generation of fathers belonged as a matter of simple historical fact to the period of high nationalism the decades immediately preceding and following Indian independence carries a burden of significance. The complex legacies of the freedom movement left an impact on filial relations in India, and together they contributed to shaping the novelist representation of the nation in their writings. I'm interested in exploring how the writer's much remarked efforts to inhabit the nation come together with this more intimate narrative and to see reflected in these intertwined thematics, the complexities of a certain historical conjuncture. Such an account highlights as well the continuities of post-colonialism as a period with the colonial nationalist era as a matter of generational inheritance. Leaders on the national scene, predominantly male, attain the status and exercise the affective force of familial elders. Gandhi was addressed as Bapu, father, by the intimates of his circle, an appellation that in India soon became as widespread as the elevated honorific of the Mahatma, great soul that he also bore. His embrace of the leadership title of the father of the nation rendered the Indian people his children, a metaphoric relationship that carries strong emotional resonance to this day. Nero himself was introduced to generations of school children as Chacha or uncle. And his birthday, November 14th, is celebrated as Children's Day. And, and this kind of familial ap appellation uh, is, is, can be illustrated from numerous sources, but this is the one I picked. The Mohandas Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru as the two most prominent nationalist leaders of the freedom struggle became moral exemplars, accepted and admired by large numbers of the Indian people. Within many, mostly middle-class or elite families, the men and women active in public life would come to be interchangeable with these at once iconic and intimate nationalist figures. Whether as active participants in the freedom struggle or as administrators in the colonial government, as business entrepreneurs or as members of the professions, they define themselves as a generation by service to the nation. Subsequently, in the independent India for which they won political freedom, they continue to exercise influence and command respect as freedom fighters. That, that sort of becomes a phrase, they're called freedom fighters, and officially that's the designation, because many, uh, they, they were entitled to get pensions. Uh, so they, you know, if you were acknowledged as a freedom fighter, then you were entitled to a lifetime pension. So that becomes, as it were, an official category. Even if their lives would come to seem anachronistic, especially as they outlived living Indians' memories of this idealized past, this, nevertheless, was the moral capital that the post-independence generation that succeeded them drew upon to constitute themselves as a ruling class. The claim made by the narrator of Mukul Keshavan's Looking Through Glass, this, this is a novel in 1994, I quote, by birthright, we, meaning their offspring, were shareholders in the nation, end quote might be the most unequivocal statement of such a feeling of entitlement, but it remains implicit in many other contexts as well. All the same, 
There was for these inheritors no escaping an uneasy sense of diminution in comparison with their ancestors. However, assertively declarations of entitlement may be made, we can still sense a certain bravado reflected in that. Growing up in the shadow of Gandhi, Nehru, and a host of revered figures in the freedom struggle who were most approximately represented by their own fathers, a post-independence generation could find itself seemingly unable to forge an autonomous selfhood as citizens and subjects. Their lack of direction is strikingly at odds with their situation of their ancestors, who even as colonial subjects were guided by straightforward nationalist allegiances and clear-cut professional goals. If one symptom of their sense of loss and uncertainty is expressed in, as what I've discussed in terms of whiteness envy, another might be termed envy of the fathers, a sort of variation on uh, an Oedipal envy. That both are generated in the process of inheriting the mantle of rule, one from the former colonial rulers, the other from nationalist fathers, makes visible the connections between a certain post-colonial selfhood and the politics of the nation. As we might expect, the active patriotism and moral dominance of fathers in this context produced complex feelings in their sons as filial reverence and filial resentment fought for dominance in their response. The denunciation of the post-colonial influence of Gandhi and Nehru launched in this speech by Inder, the protagonist of Naipaul's The Bend in the River, offers a clue to the feeling of impotence that the conflation of the roles of fathers and leaders produced in young men suffering from an inferiority complex. The plot of inheritance with its attended burdens and privileges is particularly revealing of the young diasporic protagonist, as in that is, when viewed in terms of a subject seeking to break free of his father-mediated relationship to the nation. Rushdie provides the paradigmatic instance in satanic verses in the figure of the young Saladin, who strains at the filial and national leash to escape to England. The dilemmas of such an inheritance are not, however, only psychological. They bear profound political ethical implications as well. To sum the morality of an inheritance in which the benefit of political power and privilege in the present is derived from the sacrifices undertaken by different set of people in the past, even if they be ancestors, is bound to appear dubious. Dynastic rule and nepotism both all to common and post-colonial nation states are attributable to such legitimizing claims. More pressing remains the question, can the moral high ground from which the struggle against an occupying power had been launched and fought be sustained as the basis of authority in the political sphere of the independent nation? And for how long? This question of temporality, of course, is that it's a kind of a fading influence, you know, as the years go by, that that moral inheritance becomes uh, weaker and weaker. The emergence of a ruling class and a democracy, its claim to political legitimacy is hegemonic in this sense. I explore in this paper the political and ethical conundrums of the exercise of patriotism as moral authority in the public and private spheres politics and the household, as they are posed within the psychodrama of father-son and somewhat differently father-daughter relations. The representation of the father figures of Gandhi and Nehru as presence and absence, persons and symbols in life and in death, in a handful of texts beginning with Midnight's Children, graphs a certain movement from resistance towards reconciliation in the intertwined filial relations a national subjectivity of contemporary or recent Anglophone Indian novelists. And real fathers functioning in their surrogate roles represent authority and serve as exemplary figures of patriotic ethical duty. As sons of their fathers and the successors to a valorized national history, 
the novel's protagonists view their relationship to the nation in terms of an inheritance as privilege and burden. Gandhi and Nehru loom large in the nation's cultural memory as in its state politics. More or less, this is how they are remembered on postage stamps. Not identified with any regional or other particularly constituencies, transcending even their Congress party identities, they have left an imprint on the political, moral, and cultural landscape of modern India, one that's not altogether disappeared yet. Of the two, Nehru was the darling of the English-speaking intelligentsia. His westernized persona and secular credentials had intrinsically greater appeal for later English language writers than the eccentric and problematic personality and practices of Gandhi. Besides Gandhi, having died immediately after independence, within months, as you know, uh, has been literally absent from the history of post-colonial India, surviving only as a symbol and myth for later more generations. Nehru, on the other hand, was for nearly two decades an influential shaper of the economic, developmental, military, foreign, and party politics of the new nation as its first prime minister. As someone who is visible in the flesh or in the media, on an almost daily basis, he became synonymous with the public life of the nation. Needless to say, not all the fathers who make an appearance in the fiction of Midnight Children are models of Gandhi or Nehru, or even for that matter, necessarily their followers. A significant number are. But what's more to the point is that in their varied roles as freedom fighters, civil servants, or professional men, they are invariably viewed in relation to the nation as patriots and men of principle, whether well-known or humble, they would for the most part have been in a position to be able to respond without embarrassment to the question their offspring might address to them in the form of, Father, what did you do during the independence movement? Analogously, this was uh, the kind of uh, question that was anticipated during the British war. So the most recent of the novels I discuss in this chapter, A Girl and a River by Usha, uh, poses the question in exactly these terms. So in what follows, I speak first of Gandhi and, 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 and then Nehru, but I'm going to skip the whole Nehru part here. As they appear in selected texts, both in their own historical or occasionally fictionalized personae and as mediated by fathers. I conclude with an exploration of filial relations in a more general way, tracing how the nationalism of parents impacted upon their offspring in the process of building. Now, beginning with Gandhi, the, one of the questions that comes up is of choosing ideologically between Gandhi and Nehru, uh, which is reflected in this body of fiction. The divide between pre- and post-independence Anglophone writing may itself may be, may be said to be marked by an allegiance to Gandhi in the earlier fiction, pre-independence, and loyalty to Nehru in the latter, in post-independence fiction. Gandhi's impact on the novels of the earlier period is seen primarily in terms of his national leadership. Gandhi and Satyagraha, social reform initiatives and mass mobilization of the people brought about an upheaval in the nation, both epistemic and existential, that was arguably as violently transformative as that wrought by colonialism itself. It was an historical phenomenon that could not fail to be reflected in contemporary literature and culture. Several early novels spoke of the coming of Gandhi to their localities, literally or metaphorically, in terms of such change or anticipation of change. The first and most well-known being Raja Rao's Kantapura in 1938. Gandhi's influence is most definitively, if diffusively, felt in the Indian novel in the very nature of the subjects who are newly placed at the center of novels. In Prem Chand's Godan in Hindi, Mulkra Janan's Untouchable and Kuli, and K.S. Venkatramani's Murugan, the Tiller, the peasant, the untouchable, and the laboring poor whom Gandhi viewed as integral to society and the nation came to fictional prominence in response to the radical claims he made on their behalf. 
In marked contrast to his dynamic presence in these earlier novels, Gandhi is primarily marked as an absence, a myth, a memory, and a name in the late, later fiction beginning with Midnight's Children. Disjuncture between the earlier and this later representation of Gandhi tends to be too easily explained as a reflection of the division between an indigenous Bharat and a modern India. But it's important to view it equally as a historical development of India after Gandhi, after in the sense of both following after or influenced by. My interest lies in the latter phenomenon, Gandhi's posthumous influence or otherwise in independent India. Rushdie's almost complete erasure of Gandhi from the national narrative of Midnight's Children has been remarked upon uh, often. Among other things, he gets, he just once mentions Gandhi's assassination and he gets the date wrong. In many of the novels that came after it, Gandhi's obsolescence is mocked by reference to the pious but empty public signifiers of him that have proliferated in post-independence Indian public culture in the form of statues and photographs, stamps, calendar art, street names, memorial uh, dates, his death, death anniversaries, birth birthday, etc. A comment that says more about the morally destitute state of the post-colonial nation than about Gandhi's irrelevance as such. So there's also this kind of uh, representation of him, a lot of jokey references to the Gandhi statues in particular. Uh, there's more of this kind of thing in uh, Sashi Tarur's uh, 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 um, the great Indian novel uh, in which Gandhi figures as a character called Ganga. Uh, so very often as a kind of comic figure. Rusty makes little acknowledgement even of Gandhi inspired activism in post-independence India as some other novels have done. In an essay on Gandhi written in 1998 for Time magazine, he categorically pronounces Gandhi irrelevant to the times and all Gandhians as cranks. We find expressions of similar dislike and criticism of Gandhi in other contexts as well. Gandhi's personal foibles and moral quirks, the famous insistence on poverty, the recommendation of celibacy, the experiments in naturopathy, the habits of spinning and fasting, the vows of silence and the like, were a matter of incomprehension or active dislike among followers and detractors alike, both in his own time and subsequently. And I think this is not sufficiently recognized how much uh, opposition Gandhi encountered, um, you know, so, so, so the, hence the voluminous writing that he produced, you know, engaging in arguments, persuasion, etc. In Babsi Sid was cracking India, uh, there's a brief encounter with Gandhi uh, described by the narrator protagonist, the little girl Lenny, in exceptionally frank terms of repugnance. Less merely subjective and hence more substantive in its criticism, and going to the heart of the problem Gandhi represents for secular modernists in the new India, is Rushdie's analysis of Gandhi's politics as expressed through his character Kamoans in The Moor's Last Sigh, 1995. Rushdie places Gandhi's ambiguous religion inflected pluralism against Nehru's uncompromisingly modern secularism and judges it to have the dangerous potential for appropriation by Hindu right-wing tendencies in the nation. And, and not an entirely unjustified fear as well, as you know, that has come to pass. For the Rusty generation of writers in English then, Gandhi as the father of the nation appeared to be a bad fit in post-independence India and in their own fiction. While he's firmly placed as a public figure within the national histor historical pantheon, he has no place in the family narrative. The neglect and denigration or the more benign trivialization that he suffers in these novels is in striking contrast to the veneration for his politics and personality evident in the novels that came earlier. But the moral force of Gandhi and the long shadow of his influence in shaping life were not and perhaps could not be entirely effaced. My interest in the text I've chosen for discussion here, uh, the first, a short first person memoir and two novels is provoked largely by their unfashionable return to Gandhi. 
it's through the persona of the Gandhian rather than Gandhi himself that the ideas and values associated with the Mahatma are now transmitted to a generation that did not know him in life. So the Gandhian uh, would then be the kind of surrogate, uh, the representative of Gandhi. This would be a fairly typical pictures. And what's most typical about them is that they are old. And the second most typical thing about them is they are wearing khadi, uh, which is the coarse uh, cotton cloth that is hand woven that Gandhi made popular. And this almost becomes a uniform. It's something that they wore day in and day out. Uh, so the Gandhian dis disciple, the follower, is now presented to us in the intimate terms of the Gandhian father. The gender, gender neutral parent could be substituted with some reservation. So Gandhi is mediated in these texts by the exemplary and anachronistic figure of the nationalist era father. What this suggests is the survival of Gandhian ideas as a structure of feeling into the present and a sense of the intimate everyday texture of Gandhian praxis in family life. This is particularly true of the two short autobiographical narratives that come first. One is Brijraj Singh's memoir called Data, or My Father's Will, which is published in 2001, and another Ruchir Joshi's My Father's Tongue. Both have the phrase My Father in the very title, also published as a short story in 1996 and then incorporated into his novel called Last Jet Engine Laugh in 2001. I'm going here to confine myself to a reading of Bridgeraj Singh's short piece, Data or My Father's Will, for what it can tell us about the Gandhian inheritance. Now, Bridgeraj Singh is not by any means a well-known fiction writer. I don't think he wrote anything other than this uh, short piece. Uh, he is primarily an academic and a, a former colleague of mine in Delhi University. And, uh, uh, and, and so he wrote academic books like the rest of us. But this is the one uh, piece which is uh, a memoir, a short piece. And he never wrote anything beyond this. So, but I, I find it significant because uh, I, I realize even as I read this paper that it's as autobiographical as an academic work can be. It's a kind of intellectual uh, autobiography because much of what I say about nationalist fathers and mothers is about my own parents and about Kaushik's grandparents and a sort of the kind of uh, uh, inheritance that we have been privileged to have. What this suggests is a survival of Gandhian ideas, as I said, as a structure of feeling into the present. And so Singh's narrative, uh, as, as I said, is a memoir about his father, who is the eponymous hero of this account. Now, a brief synop synopsis now, uh, by way of preface, not that there is anything like a plot or a narrative. Uh, the narrator's son begins with himself as a 10-year-old boy, whose relationship with his already middle-aged and retired father is one of great love and admiration compounded by O. He closely observes his father's life of simplicity, regularity, and order, struck by his practice of maintaining a, da a daily diary uh, consisting of brief, dry notations of everyday activities, and his regular correspondence written on one anna postcards or neat thirds of foolscap paper. As he approaches old age and death, his father presents his family with his will. He has no property of significance to leave behind, but he wishes his eyes to be donated to the eye bank and his body to the local medical college so that, as he explains, I quote, his eyes, his blood, and every other part of him which could be used for transplants would be so utilized, and whatever remained would be used for study, teaching, and research, end quote. Overriding his griefs with wife's grief and protest, she says, what would there be to cremate? He makes his son's promise to respect his wishes. This they do. And when he dies happily, only nine, many years later at the age of 90, they carry out his instructions with scrupulous fidelity. It's at this point, towards the end, that Singh offers the meditation on his father's appellation, that. Uh, so that, uh, and I quote uh, very briefly from this piece, uh, anticipating my argument and the story's moral, 
we Rajputs have a rather unusual word to address our fathers. We call them data, a Sanskrit word from the root da, to give. He also annotates this and says, this is the word that T.S. Eliot uses in the wasteland, the, 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 the meter. So fathers are data because they give life, provide nurture, supply one's needs and other source of one's values. The word sat well on him. We kept bringing up again and again examples of his generosity, how he had always given freely of his time, the little money that he had, his advice based on a right lifetime of experience, his eyes. Unquote. The story concludes with the writer making his own will. He too decides to donate his body and its organs for others to use. On his lawyer's instructions, he begins a letter to his wife, requesting her to do after his death what Data, his father, had wanted his sons to do for him. There are four related sets of observations I shall offer somewhat schematically about this text. The first relates to the father-son relationship as defined by exemplarity. The philosopher Akil Bilgrami has suggested that the originality of Gandhi's morality lies in his installing the Satyagrihi as a moral exemplar, not as an ideologue. That is the one who practiced, not preached. Gandhi did not wish moral judgment to lead to moral criticism. And therefore, exemplary action takes the place of principles. How else but by example would one convey the significance of one's choice to others when one is seeking also to avoid claiming the universalizability of principles? So this is the example Bill Grammy uses from his own life to illustrate Gandhian exemplarity. That a father and son should figure in this illustrative anecdote, as well as in uh, the story I'm discussing, is not entirely for teachers, for it's primarily by example that parents inculcate morality in their children, and it's within families that the example has the greatest force. So it is that the narrator in data imitates his father, even to writing a will, the identical will in adulthood, and at the same age as his father did. This is a gesture of reverential piety but also moral inheritance, those implications I shall return to. My second point has to do with the mode of life that is captured by the Foucauldian phrase, technologies of the self. The narrator's father follows the rituals of writing in a way that both Gandhi and the ancient Romans described by Foucault would have subscribed to. The first part of data describing the childhood of the narrator focuses on the writer's father's writing habits. I quote, every evening after dinner, my father would sit at his desk and write his diary and his letters, and I would stand beside him and watch as he wrote, unquote. This is described minutely, the dry, brief entries lacking any intimate revelations, not even the use of the first person singular. The father's instructions to his son when he initiates him into the practice the very description of the diaries, small, squat, thick notebooks with poor quality paper and binding put out by the Gita Bhavan, each page headed by a shloka, a verse from the Gita, which I quote, is probably why my father settled on this particular diary, for he started each morning with a half hour reading of and meditation on the Gita, unquote. Gandhi too was a fanatic about writing, he attended to all its material aspects as well as its praxis, the handwriting, which his was very poor, and he always uh, uh, you know, deplored that, that he couldn't write uh, better. The recycling of paper, the preference for the famous cheap Indian postal service card, postcards, the meticulousness of corresponding, where responding promptly to letters had the status of a moral imperative. Reading and meditating on the Gita too was for Gandhi, as for many practicing Hindus, a daily ritual. Many Gandhians followed these practices, reading, writing, meditation, frugality, and the discipline of a daily routine held for them the absorption of ethical habit. His father, Vrijaj Singh tells us, had begun towards the end of his life to emulate Gandhi consciously by spinning cotton. He had spun enough yarn to have a kurta pyjama made and express the wish to be dressed in these clothes after his death. 
the spinning of yarn on the charka and wearing khadi were central to Gandhi's opposition to British rule to signify the boycott of English milk cloth and the support of indigenous handicraft. Khadi, of course, lost its rationale after independence when India embarked on a major industrialization agenda, including textile manufacture. But for Gandhians, it remained one of the symbolic survivals of the past, something that persisted in the form of force of habit or as a way of resisting the changing times. I recall my father-in-law, for instance, you know, he had only two uh, shirts and two dhotis made of khadi. And, and they wore out very fast. It's actually not so practical to wear khadi because they tear very fast. And then they would be replaced by two identical shirts and dhotis. So, you know, that's what he wore all his life. So Fukuoka points out that the Stoics regarded philosophy as an art of living. And towards this end, they undertook spiritual exercises as a form of controlling the passions, which he calls the source of mankind, or mankind's cause of suffering, or, or the Stoics saw it as that. Fukuoka tracks the forms these exercises took. One of the primary techniques of the art of living for the Greeks was the act of writing. Through journals, letters, notebooks, and other forms of writing, which serve many purposes as memory aids, notes, compendia, records of doing, advice, writing became a form of personal exercise. The purpose of this writing was not to provide an intimate revelation of the self or a confession, but rather, I quote, to capture the already said, to collect what one has managed to hear and read. They were really notes, actually and for a purpose that is nothing less than the shaping of the self, unquote. Note the similarities of this with the minute of Dhaka's everyday writing of letters and his personal journal. The care of the self that emerges from a modern colonial context is obviously a different matter from the Greek or Roman practices of antiquity. Uh, but also very recently, uh, there was, uh, there's been the book by Richard Sorabji, the classicist called Gandhi and the Stoics, modern experiments on ancient values. So he actually you know, pulls out uh, these parallels. Sunil Kilnani, in trying to account for Gandhi's revelation in his autobiography for a series of personal experiments conducted in the very heat of his political activities, surmises that the attention to fashioning a life was developed in response to colonial subjection. The colonial subject was enabled by attention to the self to separate the self from the modern imperatives of the technologies of power. Now, this concept of Swarajya, Swarajya is a punning word for self-rule, meaning political freedom as well as moral self-regulation. Uh, Swa meaning self and Rajya meaning rule. So self-rule would mean both political and personal regulation performs precisely this operation in combining the two. In Bridget Singh's narrative of a will, which is the third thing that I want to move to, Swaraj is precisely what is at stake. However eccentric or merely habitual the elder Singh's practices of the self might appear in their performance. So the father's instructions in the will and the wishes that constitute a secular nationalist manifesto uh, they have something uh, peculiar about them. To begin with, there is the all too evident gendering of the self whose coherence, integrity, and will underwrite the gifting of the body. It's difficult to think of anyone but a male patriarch express such a determined decision and enforce it carrying out. The will, of course, operates as a pun on both the will of the father uh, and, and, and what he uh, leaves behind. There is another notable aspect to it. Unlike an earlier will that he had prepared, the new will stipulates that, I quote, no religious ceremonies be performed, no rituals undertaken, no expense be incurred for him, unquote. These clauses may have been inspired by Nehru's will, which was made public at his death in 1964, a document written in English that has been widely read and admired at the time and since. Nehru insisted in his will that no Hindu religious rites be performed at his death. Clearly, Data feels no contradiction between the sternly secular terms of these sentiments that he echoes and the opening expression of his full faith in God, as he says, and his soul's salvation 
between the expressions of Nehruvian agnosticism and Gandhian faith. This was a generation that had worked out in practice a kind of secular religiosity. And while the donation of the body for study, teaching, and research may reveal a rationalist faith in modern science that reflects Nehru's modernity, the sacrifice of the body and self carries the Gandhian ethical imprint. That this persistence in Gandhian ways of life finds its most complete identification in his willing away of the body. Because Gandhi himself let, left no such instructions. And I think this probably uh, most likely has to do with organ donation becoming an acceptable and feasible medical practice only after his death after his lifetime. The post-mortem gift is by definition one with absolutely no expectation of return, fulfilling the terms of what Jack Derrida envisages as pure gift, without exchange, without return. As he says, this is in glove. Leaving aside many dimensions of the complexities of organ donation, which is my first point, which is the debated status of organs as commodity versus life, the social life of things, the cultural meanings of the body, the psychological dilemmas of organ recipients and the kin of organ donors, I raise here only the issue of the gift. In my father's will, the contemporary considerations of the issue do not necessarily apply. For the father, the gift is a matter of having nothing else to give. And, and it is almost literally the meaning of the term proletariat as well, having nothing else but the body to give a flavor uh, of giving the body, of loss of self, and the logical culmination of a simple and nondescript life. Is death averts what Derrida regards as the aporia and anomaly of the gift, the possibility that the giver would begin, I quote, at the threshold as soon as he intends to give to pay himself with a symbolic recognition, to praise himself, to prove of himself, to gratify himself, to give back to himself symbolically the value of what he thinks he has given or what he's preparing to give, unquote. It's also what's referred to as the tyranny of the gift, which can be particularly onerous because the gift of an organ is so extra inherently extraordinary that it is unreciprocal. Contrary to these concerns, we find that there is no great public acclaim for this donor. The story, as I've explained, takes place in the space of the familial and the private. There is no expression of any claim to extraordinary merit on the family's part, no sense in the sons of being owed. Contemporary debates are interested in the belief that donors kin, of donors kin, that their loved ones live on in another body. The narrator does not escape this belief. He says, soon his eyes would be seeing them too, he thinks, looking at the fields of his youth as he drives past them in the ambulance with his father's corpse. But in place of an effusion upon the meaning of the gift, there is the brief and somewhat gruesome scene of an operation that doctors have to come in very quickly and take out the eyes so that it can be donated. The brothers simply leave their father's body in an empty hole in the anatomy department of the hospital when they make their farewells. The father's gesture is very much in the mode of sacrifice, performed despite its heterodox canting of the rites of the dead within the expected norms of a class and caste. The story ends as a meditation upon Da to give. The gift lives on, not as death or survival of the organ in another body, but in the will that the son writes in emulation of his father's, in the open seriality of the example, rather than the closed circuit of the gift. I read this narrative along the grain, even sympathetically, as a conscious critical attempt to recuperate its moral lessons and their existential contradictions in post-colonial India. True, the mode of living on that these writers explicate, and, and I haven't discussed Joshi, Joshi's story, which is not dissimilar to this, uh, emerges in the present as anachronism and is susceptible to recuperation as pietistic nostalgia. Memory produces a memorializing in the shaping of the post-colonial self, 
both the fathers of these sons and the sons of these fathers. The ethical is not free of ideological biases inflected by caste, religion, gender, or caste. And the unusual thing is, and he begins by saying, we Rajputs. Uh, that expression of identifying by you know, regional or caste uh, uh, facts is, is something unusual in Anglophone writing. The text makers only too aware of the circumscribed conditions of possibility of the survival of Gandhian values, the gift, known violence into the present day nation. At the same time, it would be reductive to judge the ethical values and nationalistic sentiments expressed in these texts solely by these cautions or explain them in terms of these conditions of possibility alone. When a ruling class takes its claims to political authority, it should matter. Whether its representatives do so on the grounds of wealth or its absence, by means of conquest or sacrifice, on the pretext of power or its renunciation. In the accounts of this transitional generation that values a personal ethics forged in political struggle, we are able to glimpse the formation of a certain post-colonial moral subjectivity as it passes into history. I mean, passing into history, in a sense, it's passing into the past. The most problematic fallout of the political nationalist ethos of inheritance, and one that remains intractable, is that it's exclusionary. Its narrow passage shrinks the space of a larger politics, disregarding a host of other figures, constituencies, and claimants to political entitlement or social recognition. And when inheritance is treated in gendered terms as a transaction conducted primarily between fathers and sons, what, for instance, becomes of mothers and daughters? Very often it's true women are considered a role in nationalist scripts, and in some cases they claim such a, a role, even if the terms be different from those of men. Grandmothers in shadow lines looking through glass and the last jet engine love occupy a significant space reflecting the historical fact of women's large scale and visible participation in the nationalist, and especially Gandhian movement, and consequently emerge as strong and dominant figures. But when one reads in data that fathers are data because they give life, provide nurture, supply one's needs and other sorts of one's values, and I'm quoting from the story, one cannot help thinking and what of mothers? We cannot avoid noting here that the mother's role is limited to a single plangent lament that there could be no funeral. So this, is, this is the one cry that she's allowed to speak, which consigns her to tradition and religious orthodoxy. So attention to the class, caste, and gendered aspects of the narrative of the nation is minimal in the majority of male-authored modern Indian English texts. For what is an unprecedented interest in asking how women as wives, daughters, or granddaughters might have inherited the national's legacy, we must therefore turn to novels by women. And these are the titles of a few novels, which uh, let me hasten to say I'm not going to discuss, but uh, uh, you know, these are their book jackets. So I just want to mention in somewhat detail uh, uh, Usha's A Girl and a River, uh, in two, uh, published in 2007, uh, which seems to me again to be a kind of displaced novel coming a little after uh, the rest of the uh, books that I have discussed into the 21st century. In this novel, both A Girl and a River bear the same name, Kaveri. There are two nar narratives, one that focuses on Kaveri's mother, Rukmini, and the other on her granddaughter, who remains unnamed and is the narrator of one strand of the novel. Combining, combining the waiting for the Mahatma theme of the earlier novels, that's pre-independence novels, and the thematic of fathers and offspring that characterizes the post rushti novel, a Girl and a River synthesizes what I've identified as the two distinct streams of Gandhian influence, the early and the late, the public and the private, the national and the familial, the historical and the autobiographical. The novel broaches the possibility that Gandhi and his movement may represent an unprocessed aspect of our national past, 
the invocation of which in the present, whether by way of family histories, exercises of memory or literary text, is in the nature of a return of the repressed. At the structural center of this novel is Gandhi's visit. Inevitably anticlimactic, despite or because of the high expectations it has generated, Gandhi moved around a great deal and part of the way of his mass mobilization was to go from uh, city to city, small town to small town. So this theme of waiting for that Mahatma, he's going to come, he has come, he has been and gone. So that becomes very much a crux of the narrative suspense. Fiction shows us what it means to inhabit history and that sometimes the experience is not momentous but intimate and trivial. Interested with the responsibility of providing Gandhi with his famous goat's milk on his visit to their town, Kaveri's family face a succession of comical dilemmas and problems from acquiring the goats, where do we get them? And finding a suitable container for the milk, should it be a grand vessel, should it be a mud pot and so forth. And also to decide whether the milk is to be boiled or not. It's also a perspective that demystifies great figures, now seen not from afar, but from close up. For Kaveri's young brother, Setu, and his friends climbing up to a window to see Gandhi sleeping in the high school, he's only, I quote, a small, bald man asleep on the floor, slack jawed, his dentures waiting in a bowl beside his mat next to his spectacles, unquote. For the older women, the children, the servants, and the rest of the family go to hear him speak at the Maidan. He was, I quote, so small and frail, poor man, but his kin Rukmani, even in the twilight, it was shining like copper. What will we do after he goes? Unquote. History is also played out twice over, the second time as farce, or the games of children. In the backyard, Setu and his friends play the game of prison riots and caning the prisoners based on the accounts they hear from jail return satyagrahis until history becomes too real to be turned into a game and they give it up. But of course, history is more than comedy, demystification, or a game. It represents crisis and transformation, and Gandhi was a historical force. I quote, of Gandhi, it was said that he could stir up a whirlwind with a single breath. Once he moved on, those he left behind had to reap the whirlwind, so one supposed, unquote. Rukmani caught up in intense preparations at the Mahila Sang, which is the women's group that she is the president of, for his visit, suffers from the disappointment of the cancellation of his visit to their women's organization, but does not give up her involvement. The movement takes on greater momentum following his visit or non-visit, escalating into tragedy as Sham Kaveri's boyfriend is killed in the Quit India demonstrations. Rukmini suffers two severe disappointments that act as a shock to her system and hasten her eventual death. The first is Gandhi's cancellation of his visit, and the second is the Gandhian Narayana Rao's rejection of her plea to delay his daughter's marriage. And he's a family friend who gets his daughter married off uh, at, at a, as a very young girl. And this book also uh, narrates Catherine Mayo's uh, book, Mother India, which is published around the same time. And the uh, target of that book is the attack on uh, uh, child marriage in India. So these aspects of Gandhi's politics, together with the contradiction of Gandhianism in practice, are developed in the novel's unfolding of the consequences of his cataclysmic visit. There is no question that women are viewed sympathetically and that Rukmini in particular represents the moral center of the novel's universe. But the liberated women of the family, Rukmini and Kaveri, come to a sorry end as a result of their thwarted hopes and expectations. Rukmani's illness, Kaveri's madness, Kaveri's daughter's self-effacement and Kaveri's granddaughter's exile proceed from, even as they act as metaphors for women's disappointments and frustration within the family and their exclusion from a larger public life. A Girl and a River acknowledges uniquely in contemporary Indian fiction in English, the considerable role that middle-class women played in Gandhi-led nationalist politics while at the same time investigating the psychic costs of their participation. Raja Rao's Kantapura is a distant predecessor in this. 
the author's interest in tracing the connections and continuities between five generations of mothers and daughters, which is Rukmani's own mother who lives with them, a widowed old woman, Rukmani, her daughter, uh, Kaveri, Kaveri's daughter, and who is not named, and her granddaughter, who is also unnamed. So the five generations of women, uh, um, it's, a, it's an unusual and remarkable feature of the novel's unfolding of a certain nationalist narrative. A handful of other novels written by women featuring other male readers and fathers, notably Nehru, offer comparable gendered perspectives. I should mention very quickly here that in the longer version of this paper, I do bring up some of these other leaders, uh, some of whom find mention in the novels and some don't. Uh, notably Ambedkar, uh, who is never mentioned in Anglophone novels in, and is in striking contrast to the way that he's everywhere in public culture, in the lives of Dalits, in every child in a Dalit family, uh, every male child, uh, at least one male child would be named Beam. There are statues of Ambedkar, there are posters and paintings everywhere. Ambedkar is cited, read, and you know, so he's a huge influence, but doesn't figure in the Anglophone novel. And another odd figure is Subhash Chandra Bose and, 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 and uh, Arjuna Padurai, for instance, very interesting comment about Bose. It is from his own life because his father fought in the Indian National Army. And he says, after the after independence, he was a kind of rogue nationalist. He was a nationalist pariah because uh, Indian National Army was in, in, uh, in bad order. It's very different from what it is now, of course. So Shama Fateh Ali's Tara Lane poses the ethical and existential dilemmas of noblesse oblige, a Nehruvian concept newly freighted with the political urgency of new nationhood. Suguna so Ayers and Evening Gone captures a time when Nehru as a symbol of India's modernity and a future predicated on its emancipatory promise represented the aspirations of those who believed that the stranglehold of the past might still be broken, especially for women. Quite a different sort of expectation is expressed in the context of the new Pakistan, despite the similarly dominant patriarchy of its society. In the two remarkable memoirs she has produced, Meatless Days and um, Boys Will Be Boys, Shara Saleri, writing of the new nation and an ardently patriotic father who hero worships Jinnah, the Qaid e Azam, that's how he's always referred to, father of the nation, must reconcile her name of her love of both of them, of father and nation, with her willed escape from them to exile in the West. I quote, we were coming to a parting, Pakistan and I. I felt sucked full of history, hungry for flavors less stringent on my palate, less demanding of my loyalty, unquote. So simply the sense of it being too much. And in her father's case, he's pushing her into an arranged marriage. In the case of Pakistan, of course, it's rapidly turning into an Islamic fundamentalist state. Now, by way of postscript, and I'm coming to the very end of my uh, presentation, um, <clears throat> I want to jump some years to go into a more recent book, 2013, which is Father Envy, that mix of filial veneration and resentment diagnosed and discussed in the context of the nation is, as I've suggested, historically specific to the generation of India's midnight children. This is a finding that becomes readily apparent when we encounter the very different dynamics of father-son relations of a later generation that emerges in Jaspreet Singh's Hillier, in 2013, which is a novel set in the contemporary present of 21st century globalizing India. The narrative harks back 25 years to the events of 1984, the year of Indira Gandhi's assassination by her Sikh security guards and the pogrom against the Sikhs that followed it. By this time, the nationalist era fathers have already given way to those associated with the power-driven politics of India, of Indira's, Indira Gandhi's Congress party. The father of the young protagonist, Raj, is a civil servant, a policeman showered with gallantry awards and high up on the career ladder and typically of the Rushdie generation to which he belongs, a Nehruvian. So he's always carrying Nehru's autobiography around with him. Yet he ends up being one of the officials who had supervised the genocide of men of the Sikh community in Delhi. One of the Sikh victims had been Professor Singh Raj's mentor at Engineering College. 
was burning alive at New Delhi railway station Raj had witnessed helplessly. And this is done through those burning tires that are slipped onto their heads and in a sort of kind of typical mode of killing the Sikhs at the time. The novel explores the aftermath of this trauma experienced by Raj himself and his professor's wife who also loses her children, or two male children in the riots, as well as thousands of Sikh victims and survivors in terms of guilt and responsibility. Jaspreet Singh identifies the predicament of the generation of his protagonist Raj, also presumably his own, thus, I quote, how do sons and daughters deal with the crimes of their fathers? In the novel, the son fantasizes about killing his father, calling it an honor killing of sorts. He wonders, I quote, how would Nehru write about 1984? How would the great man formulate the missing chapter on the deeds of his daughter and his two unworthy grandsons, unquote. And further, how will I write about my father? The young Raj responds to his father's what he calls betrayal of the constitution, his oath, his profession of me. By preparing with a certain madness, he says, for the GRE exams to escape India, unquote. This too follows a similar pattern, the reason for escape into exile from father and nation only too explicit in this instance. He stays away for 25 years, but even from the distance of exile, Raj cannot refuse the burden of the nation, now in the form of the sins of the father being visited upon his head. He's compelled to return to settle his demons by confronting his father, making amends to his professor's widow and reacquainting himself with his lost country. As the crimes of post-colonial history accumulate, fathers and the nation they represent have no doubt come to occupy a very different place in the psyche of a later generation of Indian sons and daughters. But the irresistible conflation of the two suggests that every family drama will follow with deadly inevitability the pattern of the past by becoming in its turn a narrative of the nation. Much questions. Would you mind asking questions, just um, maybe taking off your mask so just, just that I, I can follow you better? Um. I have a question about, um, I guess, the nation as as a unit of inquiry, um, and I guess some of its limitations and incapacities. Um, I guess, so like thinking about how, I mean, the, the, the nation as a concept is a relation to other nations, right? And so if we think about India, I mean, we think about Gandhi, right? Um, and how do we think about, for example, if we're talking about the inheritance of a nation, like the kind of reactionary politics that he brought to South Africa and some of the legacies of that in some of the more conservative aspects of like Indian Congress. Um, so how do we think about, so in a sense, the, the, the contradictions internal to a nation are also external to it, right? And in, in relation to other kind of nations, if we use that concept. Um, so then like to think about how these particular figures um, present potentially an incapacity to really understand what, what the nation is, right? Because A, because of, I mean, some of the exclusions you spoke about um, in terms of, 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 of these being some of the fathers of the nation and obviously um, Ambedkar is a huge figure and what he represents and how that's completely submerged within the vision of the nation or the dominant one, the hegemonic one. But also, I guess, like, how do we think about um, like Kashmir in relation to the, in the, in the nation and uh, the dominant, the cultural dominance of, for example, Hindi in, in places like Nepal. So I guess the, the incapacities of, of um, understanding um, what maybe we're trying to speak about because of this 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 unit of inquiry um 
I guess thinking about, I mean, yeah, particularly in a, in, 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 in a, in a place like India, which is such a strong force in the region and has such a strong military um, and what the, what the nation means regionally and internationally is, is so, um, is so different to what um, we can pull out from maybe some of these, some of the kind of unconscious um, things that are maybe missed out in these writers. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's important to bear in mind that, you know, beyond the nation, there are other spaces. And, and both these figures, I think both Gandhi and uh, uh, Nehru would be, I think, important to think about in these contexts. I think there's much more contemporary scholarship that is now emerging about Gandhi in South Africa. And the way he's been recuperated in the West is also um, striking in the sense that I think the, the, the most uh, prominence he has now is in Christian uh, uh, context. Yes, you know, as a kind of figure purely of ethics and uh, uh, also as a new age guru of certain kinds of lifestyle, you know, of veg vegetarianism and nonviolence and so on practiced in terms of, you know, various forms of uh, simplicity, simple living and so on. So I think the meaning, the resonance of Gandhi, particularly what might be seen as racism or maybe racism is not quite the word, but is uh, ignoring of black South Africans in his period before he comes to India, I think is beginning to raise a lot of issues as well. So there is, I think, Gandhi's international uh, uh, significance, as it were, global significance, which varies in different places. But a lot of post-colonial nations are fathers of the nation. And so the shift from colonialism through freedom struggles of different kinds to independence means that some figure carries that appellation of the father of the nation. And of course, that is a familial term, you know, the idea of the father of the nation and so on. And Nehru, I think, is also important to think of him in terms, and this is happening more and more, of Bandung and the non-aligned movement and the entire context of Afro-Asia uh, in which he was a, such a prominent figure. So I think the idea that, you know, there is not an isolated sense of, of India as a nation, but of a complex of nations, which in the second half of the 20th century were taking certain kinds of global positions, such as non-alignment, uh, is important to think of. And even locally, as you say, you know, Nehru's conspicuous failures in various areas, Kashmir, Kerala, and so on, and his relationship to left socialist parties. Uh, so I think these are very striking things. So there is a way of thinking about Gandhi and Nehru in real analytical, political, analytical terms on the one hand, and their symbolic, mythical, and affective kinds of presence, uh, um, which considerably sim sim simplifies and smooths out many of these aspects, you know, as they are recuperated in memory and myth and uh, you know, an official kinds of, you know, statues and uh, images and so on. So I think there is uh, clearly there are two, two ways in which they are to be, you know, regarded. And, and what you're saying is that inevitably, I think one cannot, especially in an analytical exercise like this in academic writing, one cannot help juxtaposing the two and seeing how one, as it were, you know, the idea of, of real political historical figures uh, uh, would, in a sense, uh, you know, how it qualifies, what the ways on which one thinks of them in the fictional representations. So, um, maybe it's a very broad question, but anyhow, because I think I, I might maybe have mistaken or like didn't understand properly but uh this idea that uh, in morally in morality there is no ideology or like which i would completely disagree and like especially with this how is morality used as uh these guys secularization or how secularization uses the notion of morality to these guys ideology uh, which is an important, important way of building a nation, which has been, I mean, I'm Mexican and I can, I can refer more to that, know how 
many of the Catholic moralities has been translated into a secular, guilty driven nation state, um, which I think is very important, especially in connection to the Gandhi figure as uh, like this, yeah, crafting of a secular, non secular, um, um, how do you say that, like monument almost, no. This is the thing about Gandhi, you know, it's, um, it's true that he's, he's now, he's, he is recuperated uh, by the Hindu right, but somewhat uncomfortably, you know, he, he is, he's, 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 it's not easy to recuperate on the right. And the thing in his own lifetime was this, his uh, spirituality, his Hinduism was a very heterodox one. So I think he called forth a lot of opposition, a lot of actual virulence from the Hindu right. You know, he was assassinated by a member of the RSS. And even people like my own grandfather, I think initially an Orthodox Brahmin uh, gentleman, although modern, secular, highly educated, persisted Gandhi very strongly because you know, none of the ideas that he had about caste or about, uh, you know, uh, to essentially so many ideas in which he was a modern, you know, so it's not for nothing that he, his uh, younger days were spent in the West and in South Africa. So he did have a number of ideas that fitted nowhere within Orthodox or conventional Hinduism. So there was in fact, despite his, uh, you know, and then he's often acknowledging resources for his ideas uh, in Hindu teachings, in the Gita and so on, Equally, he would acknowledge uh, sources in the West. I mean, his vegetarianism, for instance, could easily have been something that he was simply born with, as it is for many of us. We born vegetarians, we stay vegetarian. But in his case, he also came together with groups in, uh, as Leela Gandhi writes about in a uh, book, he, he, he affiliates with vegetarian groups in London. And that's where he begins to articulate his, his, his arguments for vegetarianism. Quakers and pacifists and you know uh, various fringe groups in, uh, in 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 England that with whom he affiliates and gets ideas as it were of uh, sexuality celibacy vegetarianism pacifism etc. So there are very uh, hybrid, very diverse kinds of origins for his thoughts. They are not orthodox. So I think in a way he you might say that he you know he uh, alienated. A uh, number of people who were on, on the Hindu side, and but it's also easy. I mean, I think I do see what what you know Salman Rushdie was saying that uh, you know he feels in modern India that you know invoking Gandhi for certain purposes could be dangerous because he could you know he could lend himself. Uh, it, it's like the way in which Nietzsche was used by uh, the Nazis, for instance. I'm not sure that that's entirely, you know, exculpates him. The fact that, you know, you might say this distorted, that they misused him and so on, but the potential for that distortion, the potential for that misuse lies there, right? So it's not as if uh, one could say that this was entirely blame free, but, uh, but it is, I think, considerably more, complicated than it seems that, you know, that he's simply somebody who could, you know, with a little shift, um, become a spiritual figure who could, you know, be on the season, purely religious figure. Um, I was curious, and it, it came from, I, your talk really made me think of a recent poem by a South African poet who's of my generation, my age, so kind of 40s, um, and, and, um, it's a book from a book that was published a few years back called Master, which in some ways deals with this entanglement of the, 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 the idea of the colonizer as the father figure to some extent. And if I maybe so indulge everyone and read a little bit of this poem, because I think it adds an interesting juncture to it. Okay, I won't read the full poem because it's quite a long poem. Um, Master by Dalla Sapeta. The morning is always thick. My eyes are thick in the morning. I want to sleep and wait for the mother to give me food. And I love the sun and food. 
I hate the morning because father always wants to beat me in the morning. I want son and mother. Mother makes me happy and I eat the food. Master makes me work in the garden. He, he beats father behind the field. Sometimes master rapes father too. Sometimes he rapes me. Master is a rapist and he hides behind the window and the shadows and blacks. But I love master. I know you want to write a story and I won't allow that. I know you want a story and I don't want all of your bad stories. I don't want you to press a button to tell my story because you lie. Your teeth make you lie, your eyes make you bad. Your white smile makes you rape everything. My friend will come at night. My friend is the shadows. My friend does not want your bad stories when mother sleeps. But father wants your stories in the night. Father is bad too. Father and master are big thieves. They chase each other when mother sleeps, father too. I will hurt both of them because I will hunt both of them inside their graves and kill them again and again. Maybe mother can wait them. Mother, oh dear mother, I don't know who to blame. I want to blame someone for you. I want to blame father, but I sleep when I, but I sleep well when I blame master. It was all his fault. He rapes. The, the rapes, the tears, the beatings. So I think, it, I mean, there's a much, it's a part, I read a tiny excerpt from a, my very much longer poem, but it deals a lot with this tension between the father as in some ways the, 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 the colonial figure, the, the white as the father, and then the entanglement of a new generation of black fathers with that figure. And then the absence as you speak within this power configuration of mothers. Um, I, I will, I'll send you the poem to you. It's, a, it's just but resonating. But what, what, what could be the context in which this happens, that, that a post-independence generation looks back and blames the founding fathers? Well, I think there is an element of the sense of the, the I mean, the very, and, you know, the, the way that the, the, the colonial legacy has been taken on by the new nation yeah. state and, and, and replicated by the nation state, that very phenomenon phenomena of, of, of that. And I think so that there's that start to see the con conflict figuration with the father figure and the colonial figure where they start to merge into and become one. Yeah. And this kind of tension of that. Yeah. Now, I, I was also, I suppose, curious with that in terms of a, of a, the difference and the similarities of the Indian kind of perspective. And then but from that, a very much younger generation where it's a story of absent fathers because fathers are missing fathers within South Africa. So certainly there's this, there's this for, for a younger generation, it's a generation without fathers where they don't look to the colonial heroes anymore as fathers, where the, their own fathers are very often absent. And interestingly, the mother figure has taken a, a much bigger centrality suddenly um, and becomes a much larger point of reference. I also am very aware, and it's another interesting thing in terms of thinking about this, this, this the, the globalism of everything, because there's this practice that's happened with, I see it with many of my students and especially on social media, where in the absence of fathers, a lot of looking towards literary figures. So writers become fathers. Um, um, and they, they take on that, 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 that kind of space. And, and also coming from a global perspective. So very often we'll have a young South African referring to a African-American as father. Um, so they're, yeah, they're just interesting. I can I can see I can see how it might well be that kind of narrative. So it, it, it does occur to one that some nationalist figures, figures who are prominent in anti-colonial struggles, were pro probably just as well they died before they you know <laughs> took up roles in the independent nation. I mean, we think of Gandhi and of Fanon, and, you, and it's very hard even as a thought experiment to see how they might have survived or how, the, how they might have figured in independent Algeria or in independent India. I mean, Gandhi didn't want an official role. Think of Fanon as being part of, you know, Islamic Algeria. I mean, it really is, you know, impossible. So it seems like their roles definitely come to an end at that point. 
and but those who stay on and then become leaders, I think they are susceptible to precisely this kind of, uh, you know, um, you failed us. And, uh, you know, so the transit, what happened is a transfer of power, you took over from the colonizer. And I do see that. But offhand, I can't think of literary texts that present that. And, and that could be just because I don't know about it. Others might know of texts that have been written since then, which look back and see this failure, as it were. Uh, but it seems like the narrative more often is that they come with noble ideals, well-meaning, even if they were mistaken. And then what sets in is corruption. And something like that bourgeoisie of that, that Fanon talks about, which then uh, is corrupt and becomes real politic and so on. So that becomes a narrative of progressive uh, decline rather than you know uh, the one that sees this rot set in at the very inception of the nation, which, which as, as I said, could well be a certain a way of interpreting uh, independent nationhood. Yeah. We've got time for one more question and on um, Zoom, it's Roshna. Thank you, Raji. Uh, yeah. uh, I know this, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for such a rich talk. My question is a little bit, it's inviting you to speculate a little on, some, on a remark that you made towards the end of the talk. Um, and speculate a little bit about the character of the Anglophone, post-colonial Anglophone novel. And uh, it has to do with the absence in some ways of figures like Ambedkar and Bose, because the temptation often is to say that uh, that they were not anglicized in the way that a Nehru or a Gandhi were. But we know that that's not true. Both of these figures were, were highly anglicized. And yet, I mean, as I was listening to you, I realized what a rich life Gandhi and Nehru have had not only in the in the novel, but also in popular culture, in a way that Bose and Ambedkar have had in popular culture, but not in the Anglophone novel. And I, I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on why that is. And this, despite the fact that now the authors of Anglophone novels have in fact become really dispersed and uh, they hail from many parts of the, I mean, they hail from parts of the country that are not the usual Stephanian crowd, let's say. But nevertheless, Ambedkar or Bose, and one can keep on multiplying the list, but those are two very prominent figures who, despite the fact that they were highly anglicized, never really featured or continue not to feature in the novel. And what does that tell us about the novel as a form? Yeah, thank you, uh, Rachna. Yes, um, these are a very, very narrow uh, segment of you know, writers, but they did happen to become prominent. The whole synecdochic effect of a small number of writers representing, as it were, an entire field of uh, post-colonial writing from uh, India. Uh, so I think it, that's why it's important to engage them. I think uh, because of the impact, the influence that they had because of the uh, way they represented as it were a certain uh, constituency, a certain period and group. And clearly uh, that's why I've, I'm very tempted to read many of these novels alongside history writing and uh, memoir writing and autobiographies, you know, by the same segment of, uh, of people um, like uh, Sunil Kilnani, for instance, whose idea of India is a kind of, you know, um, uh, completely is an accompaniment to these novels. You know, it's the historical account of post uh, independence India that exactly resonates with this body of fiction. And a memoir like uh, Raj Tapas uh, about her association with Indira Gandhi 
Now, there was a group of people who were so closely allied to Nehru, who began with uh, antagonism to him because they call him a running dog of uh, the West and so on, uh, because he kind of betrayed his socialism at the beginning. People on the left, left intellectuals, and then began to see him as being the best of the bad lot, so to speak, and then began to see him as, as people like us. You know, there was a diff definite kind of class aspect to seeing them as anglicized, westernized, secular, uh, you know, people who read the same books and so on. This carried over. This is all very well during Nehru's time. And this carries over into Indira Gandhi's succession. And they are part of our inner circle. The tapas are very much part of our inner circle until the emergency comes along. And then they kind of wake up with a shock to that betrayal and of a great deal of you know, complicity with what has happened. So Indira Gandhi was so much one of them. And, and for her to you have declared the emergency, you know, suspended civil rights and so on, I think this is a shock of awakening that happens. So her memoir, for instance, is all about this, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, great intimacy on the one hand followed by revulsion on the other. And a sense, of course, at that time, a sense of feeling lost. And where do you ally yourself? There's something I think many of us who, you know, have nothing to say in favor of the Congress Party or the opposition parties in India today, uh, you know, also know that's impossible, therefore, to opt for the existing party in power. So in that sense, there is a sense of, you know, complete political bewilderment and impotence. And, and of course, Ambedkar and Bose were never national leaders. And both of them, again, Bose, Bose died before independence. And Ambedkar uh, you know, resigned very soon. He never had political office, never called the father of the nation. Anyway, neither of them made any claims to that. But the other thing that we see with the new government is a systematic replacement of older icons by uh, other icons on the right. And this is very systematic. It's happening as erasure and replacement in school textbooks, uh, in pictures that are hung up in parliament, in um, you know, the naming of institutions and the renaming of streets and institutions. In all kinds of historical ways, you have figures like Malavia and Vivekananda and so on. And Anne Bose, uh, who has been you know, kind of a way of wooing uh, West Bengal, I think, by the BJP. Uh, all of this is, is happening very, very transparently, you know, removing all the older icons and replacing them. So clearly there is a kind of capital. We might call it moral capital, political capital that happens in, you know, uh, in, 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 in constructing or writing or rewriting history uh, of recent history, in fact, in particular ways. And there is, I think, that where the importance of, of, uh, of uh, these texts might lie, that they do capture a time when there is ambivalence towards Gandhi and there is in you know, extreme uh, possessorship and identification with Nehru, both of which, of course, are untenable uh, at the present moment. I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we are in a happy position as intellectuals now to take any kind of, uh, you know, clear cut pos position on this. Um, it's probably time for us to say thank you very much, Raji, for uh, this lecture.